I have faced an enemy over my life that I'd like to tell you about. You can go to the next slide. Here's a few pictures from my life. A few pictures from my story, okay? You can see that I've, I've been in some rough places in my life. Particularly, I just love this one uh, with me in the tie-dye shirt looking really rough, okay? Dude looks rough. Dude looks really rough. Do you, you know whose hand that is? That's my grandpa, who would later give me my first Bible and tell me about the love of Jesus. He was sitting there talking to me on that day when I was not doing too good, okay? Even before I was born, you guys, the enemy of my soul had tried to destroy me. My mom was told when I was in her belly, there's a problem with the baby, you're going to have to abort the baby. You got to get rid of it. Thank God that my mother was a nurse. And she said, you haven't even done the test. How do you know? So she got a second opinion. That guy said, you got to abort that baby too. Ooh, I almost wouldn't be here today. But thank God my mom was a nurse. My God Almighty made sure my mom was a nurse. That's right, devil, you lost. The devil lost that day. I was born, and my mom said, I'm not aborting my baby. You're wrong. She got more tests. Sure enough, they were wrong. So I was born. After I was born, the enemy tried again to damage me with abuse that took place when I was a child. But God delivered me. But I would have a stutter for the rest of my life. In my early years, the enemy tried to destroy me through wicked friendships. The enemy brought in this kid from the city who came out and just was always talking dirty sexual stuff to me. The enemy sent him into my life to try to destroy me. But God delivered me. In the next phase, the enemy tried to destroy me through the public education system, attempting to estrange my faith upbringing manipulate me with propaganda and scientism and a secular curriculum meant to exclude God from every aspect of life. Notice in the public school, they will never tell you about God. In fact, they, they will literally change history to exclude God from the story. Which makes me mad. In my 20s, he tried to destroy me through drugs, drinking, pornography, immorality, yet God spared my life even when I overdosed, even when I had a suicide attempt. God spared my life. In my late 20s, the enemy experienced his worst failure when I called upon the name of Jesus Christ to save me. And my sins were forgiven. I began a whole new life. In my 30s, though, the enemy kept trying to destroy me. He fought me endlessly in Owasso, attempting to defeat and minimize every victory we achieved in Christ. I mean, he fought me so hard. I remember we had raised a lot of money in kettle season, and then the enemy brought a lawsuit from something that happened like 15 years before I was even there and just wiped all that money out. The enemy just kept fighting me, you guys. And he still fights me today. But God keeps giving me the victory. Hallelujah. I want you to think about your own life now. The enemy's been fighting you too, hasn't he? I bet all of you could go back through your lives and say similar stuff to what I said. He tried to get me here. He tried to get me there. He tried to get me at that age and that age and that age. But that enemy just kept failing, didn't he? Because you're here today. You are here today in a church hearing about God's word, worshiping him. And so we can say, enemy, you lost. And I want you to keep saying that to the devil, you lost. Get behind me, Satan. You're a defeated foe, and Jesus is my savior. Hallelujah. That devil's going to come at you from time to time. You got to tell him, get behind me. Because Jesus is my Savior. You can't touch me. Get out in the name of Jesus. 
I command you. Because in the name of Jesus, you can command the devil. Did you know that? You're a Christian. You can say, in the name of Jesus, get out, devil. And he has to, he has to obey you. If you really believe I have this authority in Christ, get out. He has to obey you. So I want you to remember that. When you have a nightmare and you wake up and you feel something in the room with you, you say, get out in the name of Jesus. Maybe your wife or husband's going to turn to you like, what are you doing waking me up? Say, I was telling the devil to get out. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> you know? Come on. So today, okay, next slide. You guys have looked at me as a kid long enough. Okay, next slide. <laughs> the enemy is after us. He's prowling in the dark. But we are going to have the victory. Next slide. Today we're talking about the hidden treasure in the field. And the enemy has tried to keep you away from this treasure we're going to talk about today. He's trying to convince you that it's not really there. He's tried to keep you focused on other things. He's tried to keep you locked up in petty pleasures, but it didn't work. You're here today, and the eyes of your heart are opening. The enemy likes to keep us focused on self, caught in the grind of life, always stuck in a tunnel vision, never looking up toward the light of God who loves us. Stop and look up, brothers and sisters. See the Lord God Almighty, the one who loves you so completely. Slow down and focus your heart on him today. Even right now, he loves you. Do you feel his love right now? Open that light. Open the door to him. Let the Lord of glory into your soul. He will change you forever. And that's what we're going to learn about today. The Lord of glory who offers us a treasure. Jesus told this parable 2,000 years ago. And yet, we're going to be able to understand it perfectly today in 2024. Isn't that interesting? We can read these things at any time in history and say, I get it. It starts off like this. The kingdom of heaven, so God's kingdom system, is like treasure hidden in a field. Treasure hidden in a field. Interesting. Kind of try, try to picture it in your mind. A, field, a beautiful field. And then hidden kind of off in the corner is something shiny and bright. It's a treasure chest full of millions of dollars worth of with a gold. In our world today, gold is worth a lot. In fact, governments will buy gold and silver to hedge against inflation, which is kind of interesting. So still very valuable today. You know, I didn't know the treasure was there, you guys. For many years of my life, you saw those pictures. I didn't know it was there. I was so focused on basketball and the Packer game today and, and, and music and music videos. and These things, they distract us, right, from who God really is. The treasure of God is waiting for us. But we're stuck on something else. We're stuck on puppy, you know. We're stuck on all this stuff. We're stuck on things that don't matter. Basketball, stats, football, Brett Favre, Packers, you know. Stuck on things that don't matter. A lot of life is playing the rat race, right? And there's all these ladders that we try to climb up. We try to become more and more attractive so that a girl will like us, that a guy will like us. We're working out. We're finding the right clothes. We're going on dating sites to try to climb that ladder. And it's exhausting. I'm sure many of you can relate. Just being sick of climbing the ladder all the time. At work, too, right? Trying to get the better job. Then get to the next level. Then get to the next level. And it's exhausting. Trying to be popular on social media, right? Clicks, YouTube, TikTok. Trying to be popular. Trying to get likes. Trying to get followers. And I tried a lot of this stuff, you guys, to find something important in life. I tried the workout scene for a while. I was going to the gym, doing P90X. Anyone do P90X? It's a, it's a, it's a workout system from Beachbody. It was like super intense. There's another one called Insanity. Then people were doing yoga all the time. Anyone here do yoga? 
people have done yoga. I mean, they, they do all this stuff, always chasing things that lead that don't lead anywhere. I tried the dating scene. I tried money. Okay, I'm going to make, if I get enough money, then I'm going to be happy. More and more money. And finally, I'll be satisfied. But it's not true. We talked about Jim Carrey, right? How when he reached the top, he looked down and he said, I got here and I'm not happy. We talk about Deion Sanders, right? He had won yet another Super Bowl. He's on the phone ordering another Ferrari. And he realized, I have everything I ever wanted and I'm not happy. And you know what he did that day? In that hotel room, he got on his knees and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of these things we're talking about, working, making money, these are not bad things in themselves. Working out is not a bad thing. But it's when we make that thing our God that it becomes to be exhausting and miserable and empty and constantly climbing for something we can never reach. Instead, we want to keep God first. Let God reign over your money, your romance, your health. And he will guide you so that it never becomes a God and an idol over you. Let God reign over your money. Let God reign over your fitness. Let God reign over your eating. Let God reign over your work. Hallelujah. I know some people who are workaholics, too. They work, they work, they work, they work, they work. Uh-oh. Somebody getting called out over there? Okay. We can't let work be our God either. And believe me, with the older generation, there's a bit of a, well, you better have a job. Well, what about Jesus? Jesus has to be before that. My, my mom, my dad, my, like, for many years, my grandpa, before he became a Christian, it was, you need to have a job. And then later it was, you need Jesus. And then once you have Jesus, I know he'll work that out, right? It's different. But that comes from a generation who didn't know if they'd have food each day on the table, right? You understand? That's why there's a little bit of that there. Like my mom growing up, she would, she would eat dinner and leave saying, I'm, I'm really hungry. <laughs> I'm really hungry right now. But some of you can relate to that a few days. It's tough. So there's climbing the ladders of this world. But today, there's only one ladder I want to climb. You can go to the next slide, Sean. It's a beautiful painting that I love of Jacob's ladder. That's the only ladder I want to climb now. And that ladder says in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is the ladder to heaven, the stairway to heaven. We get so focused on money, romance, power, popularity, and work, and we don't see the treasure hidden in the field. Do you see it there today? It's right there. It's the kingdom of God. And it's all around us, you guys. Every day, the kingdom of God is all around us. There are spiritual battles going on all around us. Angels, demons, spirits. There's things that go on around us that we don't see that are part of the kingdom of God. And things that are fighting against the kingdom of God. If you can't quite see it today, don't worry. Keep seeking the Lord. Keep showing up at church. It took me years. I remember reading the Bible in jail and not getting it. <clears throat> I remember reading the Bible at the rehab, not getting it. And finally, one day, it made sense to me for the first time. So if you're there you're right now, you're like, I don't get it yet. That's okay. Keep showing up. Keep seeking his face. Keep reading the word. One day, I believe it's going to click into place. Okay? And when I saw that treasure of God, well, everything else became secondary. I wanted that treasure. The enemy did everything he could to stop me from seeing it and getting it. You have an enemy in the world who wants to keep you distracted from the treasure available to you. To access the treasure available to us, we need to understand how God's kingdom system works. Next slide. How does God's kingdom system work? This is what we've looked at so far. 
And then the fourth one, it's everything it says. That's what we're looking at today. But just to review, uh, and I'm going to keep doing this each week, I, I, we want to fit these things together as one big picture. So the first one, you guys remember we talked about the return home of the prodigal son, right? That is, the key, that is a key feature of the kingdom of God. The goal is that you, 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 all of us would be brought home safely to God. Number two, transformed. We talked about the need to be born again, right? That to enter God's kingdom, you must be born of the Holy Spirit. You must be washed in the blood of Jesus. You must be made into a new person. You have to be born again. It's a requirement of God's kingdom system. Number three, we talked about the prodigal, or I'm sorry, the good Samaritan. Now, one of the features of God's kingdom is that once you're in it, you now become an ambassador of it. Do you get that? <clears throat> Your job is to bring others into the kingdom of God through Jesus. Your job is to bring others to the feet of Jesus. That is now your job. And now today we're talking about the treasure hidden in the field and how that fits into this big picture of God's kingdom. Amen? Jesus tells us the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Next, verses 45 and 46. Go to the next slide. When a man found it, so he finds the treasure in the field. He hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Interesting. This guy was out walking one day, and he's crossing the country. He's probably walking a path he's walked many times. And one day he's crossing the valley, and he stops, and something catches his eye. Go to the next slide. It's shiny. It's, it draws him, and he walks over, and sure enough, it's a chest. He flips the chest open, and inside, he is shocked to find thousands of gold coins. It is a priceless treasure worth more than he could possibly imagine. That is what it is like when we first discover the gospel of Jesus Christ. We realize we can have all of our sins forgiven. Remember the day when you first realized, whoa. I, I, I never knew this existed. I didn't know this was so beautiful. This had never been explained to me in this way that Jesus loves me, that he would forgive all my sins, that I could have him now, today, and that he would make me new. We don't have to go to hell. We don't have to suffer eternal wrath from God. We can be saved. What could be greater than that, you guys? Nothing on this planet you know, my, my wife tells me before I go to church sometimes to preach, she's like, Justin, no pressure. I'm like, are you kidding me? If, if this stuff is true, if there is a heaven and a hell and there really is a God, and people are either going to go to hell or heaven forever, then what I do as a pastor is literally the most important thing on planet Earth. I mean, it's more important than like the president of the United States. It's more important than, than like... The, the United Nations, it's more important than like a doctor because this, if we get this or not, is going to determine our eternal future. I'm just, I'm just believing what it says. And if that's true, that what I do as a pastor is so important, it's more important than you could possibly imagine. And what you do as a Christian is also more important than you could possibly imagine. Unless this is all just a fairy tale. But if that were so, I wouldn't be up here. <laughs> I, I know it's real because God, you saw the pictures, right? God changed my life. And I know he's done that for Jesus. I know he's done that for Capone. I know he's done that for Margaret. Okay, all of you. <clears throat> so it's real. And if it's real, then it's super important. <laughs> I don't know how else to read it, you guys. I know some pastors get up here and they treat it like it's, you know, just a Sunday fun time. This is life and death. It is. I don't know how else to read it. I don't. This is real. Then it, it's really important. So my wife says to me, no pressure. Which is true. 
because God's in control, right? It's not about me, but it's, it's still a big deal. It's really a big deal, more than we realize. So this man finds a treasure, <clears throat> and he hides it again, and he leaves. He finds the owner of the field, and he asks the price to purchase the field. The price he finds out is going to be high, very high. It will cost him everything he owns. So the man says, you know what? It's a high price, but I'm going to do it because the value of the treasure is so astronomical. Next point here, when we see the gospel of Jesus, we are very excited. But there is also a price we pay as well, in in a way. At the same time, it, it is a free gift, right? What Jesus did is a free gift. And yet there is a cost, you could say, in that we have to give up our old ways. Repent of our past sins. That's not really us paying anything, though. That's just us being changed by Jesus and letting him change us. We have to give up our sins. That's repent and believe, right? For many years, I knew there was something true about Jesus. I would think about it every once in a while. I think, there's something, I think there's something there that's true. But I would not go near it because I wanted my sin still. I wanted to be able to drink and party and do drugs and sleep around. I wanted those things. So I would, I would avoid Jesus. And eventually, when I got to rock bottom, I said, you know what? I'm taking the deal, and I am going to let go of my sins. Many people I know will come so close to Jesus, but when they find out they have to give up their sins, they decide against it. But a wise man or a wise woman knows the value of the treasure. They are willing to give up everything, and they do. The man who found the treasure realized it's worth it, so worth it. So he gets to work selling everything he owns. He sells his house. His donkey is, but he has a garage sale. He sells everything. He sells everything. And after he does, he realizes, I've got just enough for the field. So he goes and he buys the field. And he digs up that treasure and he celebrates. He's done it. It took giving up everything he had. But finally, he has that priceless treasure. And he celebrates. Thank you, God. That's the first example today we get from Jesus, treasure hidden in a field. That's what it's like when we find the gospel. It's like it becomes everything to us, where we give up everything we used to have, and we embrace this new way. My life completely changed when I became a Christian, you guys. Completely. I was on a completely new new footing. I was in a new field, right? It changes everything. But there is a second example. I do want to touch on it briefly. It comes immediately after in verses 45 and 46. You can go to the next slide. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. Similar situation. We have a merchant who is in search of pearls. He finds a beautiful pearl that is more beautiful and perfect than any other pearl he's ever seen. So he went away, again, sold everything he had, and bought that one pearl. Because he knew its value was beyond anything else. You can go to the next slide. Yeah. He found that one, sold everything he had, and bought it. Believe in your heart, brothers and sisters, that what you found in Jesus is more precious than anything in the universe. Because it's true. Now the question remains... We found it. We're here. We bought the field. We have the treasure now. How do we begin to clear out distractions and fully embrace what we found? Because for myself, my mind is always telling me, but I want to do what I want to do. So I'm not going to keep Jesus off to the side here and kind of do what I feel like. Can anyone relate? And just kind of come to church and listen, but don't really change my life. We start to want to play games, don't we? Say, well, I I, I love Jesus, but I'm also going to keep these other things too. And uh, we start to kind of play games, don't we? We kind of take back our life slowly from Jesus. 
Here's a powerful illustration that I found. You can go to the next slide. This is from an author. He said, to bring to the place where you live only the best and most beautiful. What a plan for one's life. This is well within the reach of everyone. Think of using one's memory in that way, your mind, your memory. As one lives from day to day, there are all sorts of experiences, good, bad, beautiful, ugly, that become a part of your past, a part of your memory, right? To develop the ability to screen one's memory so that only the excellent is retained for one's own room, a room like your mind. All kinds of ideas pass through your mind, don't they, throughout the day? All sorts of thoughts from the moment you wake up. I want you to have a, 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 an idea like this. Begin to screen those thoughts and turn them toward God. When you have a thought like, man, I'm, I feel like crap today. You say, no, in the name of Jesus, I am more than a conqueror today. You challenge the negative thought with, the, with God's truth. I want you to do that in your mind throughout the day. When you have a negative thought, I'm afraid right now. No, I'm going to be courageous in Jesus' name. You challenge those negative thoughts. That's a battle for me every day, the battle of the mind. I got a lot of thoughts going on up here all the time. I bet all of you can relate to that. You're always thinking, aren't you? Challenge the negative thoughts. Screen out the bad stuff and bring in the good. Think it over. Which areas do you keep for the place that you live? It is well within the mark to say that the oft-quoted words of Jesus about laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven deal with the same basic idea. The place where you live is where your treasure is. Where your treasures are is where your heart is. Where your heart is is where your God is. So this is a battle of the mind. And if you are blocking out negative influences, blocking out stuff you probably shouldn't be watching on TV, for example, Movies maybe you shouldn't be watching that are a little too violent, a little too sexual. Screening out music that maybe is a bit too negative and nasty and replacing it with Christian rock, Christian rap, whatever it might be. Watching different kinds of movies, Christian movies maybe. You are beginning to win the battle of your mind. And if you're in here as a Christian today saying, I know I have Christ, but I'm constantly in a battle of my mind, change your inputs. Just do it. Change the radio station you listen to. Change the shows you're watching. Change what you're listening to, music. Change maybe the people you're hanging out with. Change the inputs. Win the battle of your mind. And pretty soon as you do that, you're going to wake up each day and realize, wait a minute, I have a peace that I didn't have before you're winning that battle of the mind. We have to eliminate distractions. That's the enemy's greatest trick, is to keep us constantly focused on television, internet, parties, texts, working, dates, and we never have time for God. The battle occurs in the mind. That's where it must be won. You can go to the next slide. C.S. Lewis said, and we just talked about this, didn't we? Christianity, if false, is of, is of no importance. If Christianity is just a lie, then it doesn't matter at all. We might as well just all leave. If Christianity is false, if it's not really true, then there's no point. But if Christianity is true, it is infinitely important. The only thing it can't be, though, is moderately important. And we as Americans, we as Americans, we try to go for this middle one, moderate, right? Uh oh, we got a drummer back there. Maybe she wants to praise the Lord. Huh? It's either of infinite importance or of no importance. It cannot be moderately important. Right, sweetheart? That's right. So, since we believe it is true, we got to keep it of first importance. The human mind will want to keep Christianity off to the side. We try to follow Jesus and keep our sins in a backpack with us along the way. 
But that will not work. There's no hope for that. It only leads to double-mindedness and shipwrecked faith. Many Christians lament the lack of enthusiasm in the churches. Why aren't, why aren't people more excited? Many Christians lament the fact that where, where's a revival in the body of Christ? But we need look no further than the mirror to find the problem. We attempt to keep Christianity on the side and treat it as moderately important. And that's never going to work. It's either everything or it's nothing. We must keep Jesus first in everything. Anything we lose or give up for the sake of the kingdom is nothing compared to what we will gain. There are millions of distractions in America, millions of distractions in this city that threaten to disrupt our ability to keep a pure focus on Jesus Christ as the first importance of our lives. We must learn to fight ourselves and wrestle within to keep Jesus first. That's not something I can do. It's something I have to pray about and just say, Jesus, I, I ask you to be first in my life once again. Please take over once again. Be first, Jesus. I repent of keeping you second or third or fifth or eighth in Jesus' name. Maybe you want to pray that right now. What's the difference between a Christian who is like on fire and a Christian who's kind of all over the place and kind of lost and kind of struggling. That's right. How'd you know I was going to say that? They fought the fight and they won. And it's the battle in their mind that they won. They, they won the fight. And they've consecrated themselves. Yeah, absolutely, in a good way. Yep. And they've made Jesus first. Because they fought the fight in their mind. Next slide. <clears throat> the uh, general of the Salvation Army, the guy who started the Salvation Army, was William Booth. Who, 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 who near knew that? William Booth. One. Okay. William Booth, okay? He started the Salvation Army in 1865, about 150 years ago. And he was once asked in an interview, because William Booth, you guys, he started this one guy... One guy in a bar, standing there in a bar, preaching in the bar. And the people in the bar would throw stuff at him. That's how William Booth started. One guy in a bar, people throwing stuff at him. He got hit in the head with a glass bottle a few times. But eventually, one guy got saved. He was a big, tough guy like Jesus. And he stood, this big, tough guy would stand next to William Booth, and if someone got up and throw something, the, the guy would just go like this. Huh? That's what I thought. Keep preaching past him. <laughs> and that worked. One guy! Pretty soon the whole bar got saved. Pretty soon people are marching through the, through the streets in the thousands, proclaiming the gospel. Do you know what happened next? The bars got so mad that they'd lost all their clients. They started the skeleton army, and they would attack the Salvation Army in the streets and, and throw bricks at them. Isn't that crazy? That is so crazy, right? But then they won the day against even the skeleton army. And the Salvation Army spread throughout the whole world, even to the United States. General William Booth, near the end of his life, was once asked to reveal the secret of his success. Why did all this, why did history turn around this one man? After some hesitation, tears came to his eyes and he said, quote, I will tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I have, men with greater opportunities. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus could do with them, I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth. It was this which led Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman, the questioner, to remark, I learned from William Booth that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. Surrender to God today. Be first over me, Jesus. Do something huge through me. And he will. He will. 
In conclusion today, and get ready for the discussion time, I'm going to want you guys to raise your hands and give your thoughts now, okay? The blessing is, for, in conclusion, we found the greatest treasure imaginable, hidden in a field, the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus Christ. But there is a challenge embedded in this as well. Is that since we found such a great treasure, our response must be no less than to keep Jesus Christ as the most important focus of our lives. Applications. How do we live this out? We've learned about the treasure. We've learned about obtaining that. We've learned about letting go of distractions. First, living the parable of the hidden treasure means seeing God's kingdom as a beautiful treasure available to us. It's pretty basic, right? We see it that way. B, living the parable of the hidden treasure means Jesus is the most important part of my life. Amen? C, living the parable of the hidden treasure means leaving behind any distractions that could disrupt your walk with Jesus. That's, that's, that overview is everything we talked about, right? Those three are the big things. Hallelujah. Let's pray, and then we're going to have our discussion time. Lord, we surrender afresh to you, Jesus. You are the treasure. Your kingdom is the treasure, God. We repent of keeping you second place to other things, Jesus. Have mercy on us and forgive us for that. We name you as the king of our lives. Number one today, Lord Jesus. Take the seat of our hearts, Lord Jesus, as the king of our hearts. Right now, we repent of keeping you second, third, fifth, eighth. We name you as first in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen.